Hey everyone, Ripley Sellers with Bob's Watches. I'm here in the studio with Justin for another episode of Vintage of the Week, where we pull aside one fantastic vintage timepiece and share with you exactly why we love it. We got something nice today, Rip. Yeah, something yeah. really cool, and it's in a box this time, but uh, before first, we get into it, let's do, do a wrist check. Okay, well, I'm uh, wearing a GMT. Little hint, we got a good GMT today, so I figured I would GMT. stay on brand. But uh, yeah, I'm wearing the Rolex GMT Master II. Um, I'm wearing the blue and red Pepsi bezel. It's a good choice. To me, it's classic. Love it. Classic. I always love lumen bezel GMTs, and that one you're not compromising on any of the functionality. Yeah, it's nice. What do you got? Uh, my Speedmaster. Uh, this is Another one classic. of my actual watches. Yeah. You know, contrary to popular belief, what we wear in these videos isn't always ours. Right. But no, I actually own this one, so it's, uh, it's on my wrist. This it's one. always a good choice. Yeah. All right, well, let's get right into it. Yeah, so um, I think one of the things, obviously, it's a box and papers, and I think that's more impressive the older you get. Yeah, it's always kind Having, of a, a big bonus with vintage, right? Exactly. So many are lost. Yeah, and, you had a new, brand new watch with box and papers. Now that that's not all that special. And then I guess while we're doing this here, right here, you can see it's a. This kind is a giveaway right here, one six seven five zero sure. vintage GMT. So again, matches on the outer box. You don't see that very often. Again, papers. here on the papers, yeah. And uh, again, you know, one of those things that matters to vintage collectors: punch papers. So yes. that's you know, and. You know, again, one of those things where that's the easiest part to lose over the decade. Yeah. But getting into the actual watch itself, again, more papers, hand tags, really kind of a full kit here. Yeah, we love seeing that full kit on these vintage watches. It's just so cool to... I also love the old boxes. Yes, and <laughs> let's see, this one's actually in really good shape. These old boxes are, uh, you know, a lot of things in the, in the olden days were built way better than they are now. And I feel like these old Rolex boxes are not one of those. They just... They just seem like they they always seem to fall apart, and you know maybe it's just time or whatever, but they just seem to don't last very well. This one's in really good shape. Yeah, and it, you can actually kind of do something with it. The new ones are just such a s solid piece, but right. I, I know a few people kind of take the internal packaging out and kind of keep it as a little coffee table yeah, box. Yeah, they are cool. I mean, it has like that wood grain on the inside, beautiful box. Oh, very much not like what they do, but into the watch itself. Yes. Uh, 16750, so technically speaking, the third iteration of the GMT. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the 6542, you know, pre Crown Guard Bakelite from the 1950s. Right. And then you get the uh, 1675, which took it all the way, you know, up until the 80s, where you see Crown Guards, case side 40 mil, gilt then to matte dials. And what we have here is an example from, I believe, about 1986. So this is after the point when Rolex switched from matte to uh, gloss, gloss dials mm -hmm. with applied white gold markers. So it's a transitional reference. Sure. Um, and uh, among what that means, you get the 3075 movement. So you get a quick set. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big one. That, that is a big one, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but it's uh, very aesthetically vintage, right? Um, so it has the acrylic crystal, which is kind of always a, a dead giveaway when you're talking about vintage. You know, it just, it just gives it that vibe. Um, it also has this bezel, right? We gotta talk about this bezel. Gorgeous I mean, bezel color. Beautiful aging on this. Yeah, kind of that cotton candy, light blue, pink, instead of that really, well, like yours, that really saturated red and blue. Right. Uh, you know, Super America type of colors. Yeah. This, I really like how it fades, but you the bright red GMT hand still there. And I think the dial itself is worth discussing. So the, this 16750 can be found either with matte dials on the early side uh -huh. or this dial, which is you know gloss, white text, applied white gold markers. And usually that lends towards a more modern right. general appearance. Uh, but in this instance, there's a nice patina on the hour markers and then the surface of the dial itself kind of has this texture to it, kind of somewhere between like a concrete and an orange peel. It does. If you kind of catch it in the light, you can see where, yeah, like concrete or orange peel is a, a good way to describe it. It's, it's almost rough. Yeah, yeah rough. It's, it's grainy, but it's, it's even. It seems like a very uniform kind of roughness or grain across the whole dial, which is, is unique. I mean, we see these dials, um, you know, age and patina in Got a ton of different ways, right? I mean, there's just so many unique ways that the same watch or same dial can patina. And this one, we don't see all that often. I mean, every once in a while, we'll see one with the same marking on the dial, but um, it's kind of unique. Yeah, it's different. I mean, there's I, whatever Rolex was doing with their dials in the 80s wasn't quite, you see the spider dials, you right. see these. So something in the clear coat or you know, on the surface layers wasn't 100% perfect. But what that adds is quite a lot of intrigue for today's collectors. And yeah, you're right, you don't see these. I don't even know if it has a nickname like spider dials. Like I don't 
know if people call it the orange peel dial or something right. like that. So, I haven't heard a moniker yeah, for it. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of off the beaten path. Some people would even consider it damaged, but again, that kind of goes for any type of patina, whether sure. it's tropical or, and obviously those carry a significant premium. Yes. Um, and even the bezel itself, it's faded, you know, is that where, at what point does damage and patina cross up? But in this instance, both the dial and the bezel, I think it really adds to the overall appearance of the watch. It does, and it, it um, they work together. Um, it's to me, it's always uh, when I see a bezel that you know has a great patina on it, and then everything else on the watch looks new, or maybe we see the markers patina, but everything else looks new. It's it's a little out of place. I like seeing a situation like this where it's like uniform. You can tell it's like you see some patina on the markers, you see patina on the bezel, the dial has faded or the dial has, you know, changed a certain way. Um, and I think all that kind of adds to, you know, the vintage vibe and the vintage feel of it. And I love that. I mean, technically, you know, you, you talk, yeah, maybe it's technically damaged, right? And I feel like it's a very personal thing too. Some people, uh, you know, prefer different levels of patina and color change or, um, you know, something like that, but I think it, it adds to it, especially on a vintage piece like this, it really sells it. Yeah, I like, for me, I like my vintage watches to look vintage, but I also want certain elements to be well-preserved. So for, in this instance, the case and bezel ring, still pretty sharp. Uh, right. You can tell this watch has been polished before, but very sympathetically mm -hmm. so, didn't you know destroy the case line, it's still got shape, the bevels yeah. on, the, on the lugs. Um, and for me, I want I want a clean, nice, sharp case, but I do want the dial, the patina on the loom, you know, the insert, the, I want it to kind of look a bit old. And this, despite not being a matte dial, the faded bezel, the loom on the patina, the dial texture itself, it's just not that really bright, glossy appearance. Right. Plus the acrylic crystal, it just reads vintage, more so than a lot of other watches from the mid 80s. Absolutely, this is one I feel like it feels older than it is. At a glance, it looks older than some 1675s, yes. even though they have a matte dial or even a gilt dial and right. are appreciably older pieces. Um, this one, again, it's it was sold in 1988. Production dates at about 1986, which mm -hmm. is entirely consistent, and the bracelet fitted to it, uh, likely the original one has a clasp code for 88 as well. Right. And again, that was entirely consistent at the times. So Rolex likes to say it takes them over a year to build a watch. Well, it's very conceivable that from the point the case is manufactured to the point it rolled out the retailer, sure. there's over a year or two there. So uh, full kit, box, papers, hang tags, it's a great vintage watch, but it's also, from a price point perspective, pretty strong value proposition compared to even a matte 16750 right. or certainly a 1675. The delta between a 1675 and one like this is significant right. and you don't get the quick set date with the 1675. So we've talked about that before and this watch kind of falls into that same camp where um, it's a nice bonus where if you want a vintage watch, you like the look, you like the feel, you like the idea of the vintage, um, but you also can appreciate some of the modern benefits that come with a watch that's a little bit newer, like this one, like we're talking about a quick set, right? We got the newer movement. Um, so to have that same vintage look and feel, but also some of the modern luxuries of a newer watch, this is one that kind of fits right in that that sweet spot, and um, I personally like that. I think it's a great choice. Yeah, for I mean, some people wear their vintage watches every day. Some people mix them into the rotation, and I we always joke about you know, guy doesn't have a quick set of his watch, wants to wear, is going to wait until the seventeenth of the next month <laughs> right. until, until it kind of lines up again, or you just spend a ton of time fiddling with it. But in this instance, you don't need to do that, but you still get to enjoy an acrylic crystal, yes. tritium loom, nice you know faded bezel insert, and so you get a lot of the fun of the vintage watch and a lot of those same aesthetic points without kind of those extra minor headaches on the right. day to day. And you're also saving a decent chunk yeah, of change in the absolutely. process. Let's talk about the bezel one more time because I feel like patina is something that's very personal with watch collectors. Um, some people want no patina. They would rather have the new old stock like the day it came off of the showroom floor. Some people would like it to be extremely well worn. I mean, we've seen some of these bezels. You see some ghost bezels and things that you'd be hard pressed to make out the numbers on that yeah. bezel. I mean, it's faded pretty much gone. And I feel like it's such a personal thing um, on what patina you like. And I wanna know what you like. And I also wanna know what our viewers like. I'll start personally. I like a patina, but I don't like too much of a patina. When I when it gets to the point where I, it starts being hard to read or illegible, something like that, it's that's where I'm kind of like, eh, I wish I had a little more. This one is almost perfect. It might be a little far faded for my personal um, preference, 
Um, but this, I think, would be like the limit of of my uh, of my patina preference. What about you? How do you feel on it? So when it comes to bezels, I, I like a decent amount of patina. But you know, patina is kind of like hot sauce. You know, you right. want you want enough spice to let it know it's there. But at the same time, you go too hard and you can't read the numbers. It at that point, it. it kind of ruins it for yeah. me. Uh, for GMT bezels, I like when you can definitively see a difference in color. Uh -huh. But I really like when they get washed out like this. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's something we said for mint condition. But right. for the GMT itself, I really love when you get it really washed out like this, yeah. where it's kind of this sky blue and light pink. Okay. When, on the dial in hands, it really depends on the watch. For me, it has to complement the rest of it. So right. on this, I think it looks great, but if this had that really deep orange rich pumpkin patina, I think that might be a little too heavy for the bezel insert. Okay. So it's there's kind of got to be that balance, but <clears throat> as far as GMT bezels, this one's gorgeous. This one's really nice. Well, we're curious. Uh, what do you guys think about patina? Let me know. Do you like a lot of patina, a little patina? I'm also curious about the colors. You know, you talk about those fuchsias and blues and, you know, they really turn quite a different color than they did. Is that something that you guys prefer or do you prefer the more traditional colors? I'm really interested. Leave us a comment below and let us know what you guys think about patina. Yeah, and let us know what you also think about the fact that modern ceramic bezels simply will not patina. That's you know, another good short point. Short of being like a particle accelerator or something, you know, sure. it's going to be its exact same color and more or less scratch free forever. Forever, right. Yeah. It's going to look like that new old stock. And there are some people who want that. So if you prefer that modern, really, really unflinchingly modern, non-faded, non-scratched appearance, let us know that as well. Yeah. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for this one. This is a beautiful watch. But we do have some questions, right? Gorgeous piece. Absolutely gorgeous piece, but we get a lot of questions on this We channel. do get a lot yeah. of questions on our social media, YouTube, everything, and today we're going to answer a few of those, right? Going to answer a few. Okay, great. Let's get right into it. So it's not just me and Justin answering these. We have our vintage specialist, Brandon Frazen, with us today, and he's going to be open to answer these. So, uh, Justin, what do you have for us? All right, let's get right into it. Uh, well, this is very appropriate for Brandon. <laughs> um, from Timber WVU from Instagram wants to know, what years are considered vintage? That's a good, tough question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's hard to answer, but I think a lot of people use twenty years, but now you know twenty years really isn't like that long ago anymore. It's just kind of weird right. for watches. But I would say it comes down to the characteristics of the watch. Like if it has an acrylic crystal, if it has tritium loom, I even would consider vintage watch like vintage Rolex if it has to, an aluminum bezel. You right. Know? So yeah, exactly. That's what I was gonna That's say. This one seems like a very black and white question, but it's probably the furthest thing from it because I would I would agree. I think it's like, you know, twenty to twenty five years if you're putting a number on it. But like Brandon said, uh, I feel like it's a lot more about the traits and characteristics yep. of the watch. Things like acrylic crystals, things like matte dials, yeah, and you know, sure. things like that really make it more vintage. Yeah, because all the transitions didn't happen at the same point in time. You know, we were you, if you Rolex switched from acrylic to sapphire all at once, it'd be easy to kind of point to that line in the sand. Yeah. But you're going to have some watches during the late 80s with acrylic crystals mm -hmm. and then you're going to have some watches from the late 70s with sapphire and then right. it, and then with that watch that has a sapphire crystal if it gets service hands and dialed and there's no more tritium how does that affect it and then you have to also look at least within the context of rolex they may keep a watch in production for over a decade almost i mean some of the watches have been around for 20 years and oh, yeah. at that point by the time it gets discontinued it could technically be vintage right so the early ones could be vintage the later ones could be more it's modern. the same exact yeah, watch for all intents and purposes yeah, yeah. i think okay. it really comes down to kind of like yeah, so the, the components yeah. we'll say 20 to 25 years if we're going on a number but that has a big asterisk by right. it uh you know it's really never more so about exactly. acrylic crystal tritium yeah. right. loom aluminum bezels yeah. all of that okay that's good all right well let's move right on um next is another one from instagram uh apologies if i butcher any of these <laughs> You can also correct me in the comments, let me know how it should be, but this is from Bira Judd from Instagram, and he says, how is vintage holding up with the current situation in terms of market for watches and, you know, just the pricing and the, how it's been recently? From what I've seen better than, than modern, just because there the is same. a finite example, everything's going to be subject to its ebb and flow, but um, just the, by virtue of the fact that there's, they've been discontinued for years, decades, there's right. the finite number, There's a, the supply's only getting tighter over the years as they get lost, destroyed, broken, end up in people's personal forever collections. Right. Um, have you been noticing the same thing working in it exclusively? Yeah, I mean, I think vintage is holding up pretty well, and, and it really comes down to kind of like the, the watch itself. If it's a really good example, top quality, I think that's always going to, you know, perform strong, you know, yeah. command a higher price. And people are looking, you know, now more than ever, people are looking for these really 
high quality examples. Yeah. So, and the prices are still going to be strong for those. I've seen the same, and I think that um, there's less that affects the vintage prices than the modern. I mean, with these new watches still being in production, if Rolex announces that it, it's being discontinued, that can have a huge effect on the price. If they come out with a different variation, that can have an effect on the price. If it starts going up and everyone, you know, knows that they can make a lot of money by flipping <laughs> it, then you know, there's just all these things. And vintage watches are kind of immune to all those because they're they're out. They're done. Rolex isn't changing them. They're finite, um, you know, and I think that keeps it a little more stable. But I, I agree with you guys. I think they've been doing pretty well in consideration or considering um, comparing them to modern watches. And the demand is still strong for and them. And the demand is still really strong, yeah. yeah. And there's no way to get them except on the secondary market. There's some people right. who hold out hope, you know, against all odds that they're going to get a call from their retailer. On the vintage market, unless you have a time machine, you're never going to buy <laughs> that watch new. Right. right. So um, there is kind of that factor where the market is the market. Rolex can do whatever it wants with modern supply, and it's not going to change a thing on it. Exactly. Probably. All right. Uh, well, next up, we got a question from YouTube, actually. This is from Futurama 10,000. <laughs> and they say, I love vintage subs. I have a ceramic sub date, but if I buy a vintage Submariner, is it too much of the same thing? If so, should I go with the vintage GMT or Daytona instead? Not too much of the same thing. I, you, I think the modern <laughs> sub and the vintage sub are very different watches, right, so I, I think agree. there's room for both in the collection. I might want, if personally, if I was in that position, I might start with the GMT or the Daytona first and then circle back to the sub, but between a vintage sub and a modern sub, is there too much overlap? Me personally, no. No, I don't think yeah. so. I probably, I mean, there are some people who just collect subs. Yeah, you know, and just a, collect vintage subs. Right. Even. <laughs> there's a lot of differences between even two watches from the same, you know, era. So I think I think having a modern and a vintage is pretty cool. You could see kind of like where the modern one came from. I agree. Uh, I don't. I think, yeah, I don't think it's the uh, fact that it's vintage. That's just as different as a completely different watch exactly. to me, right? You have the modern and vintage, um, so I absolutely don't think it's the same, uh, it's too much of the same thing. Um, personally, I would opt to get all of them. <laughs> I say you get the vintage sub and the GMT and the Daytona, right. depending on which one you start with is more of a personal preference, but yeah, I'm in for all of them. Yeah, and it's nice, you could have the modern sub for daily wear, to the beach, whatever, to the pool then your vintage one could be sure. more special occasion, so you could break it up that way too. Yeah, that's a good so point. That's kind of nice. Yeah, I think the point of being able to compare and contrast and just sort of see the lineage, because the sub is such an enduring design oh, yeah. that you are able to look at an old one, look at the modern one, and see one-to-one -one where things came from, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it is an appreciably different watch. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, well, next up, we got another question from Instagram, and this is from <clears throat> Kidland KY, and they say, my everyday Rolex is a 16570 circa 1996. When should I expect the indexes to start to patina? <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is another broad answer, right? Yeah, we yeah. need to know so much about their lifestyle, where they're living, you know, age of the watch, right. you know, did it ever have its dial or hands replaced, how much right. sunlight it's getting, you know. Yeah, I mean, was there ever any moisture damage? Um, I mean, that's a really tough one to tell, so. I would say just keep watching it, you know, and maybe one day it'll turn yellow. Yeah, it's something. one of those you kind yeah, of never like, know. We've seen, I've seen watches from, you know, the same time, the same watch from the same year that, you know, we put out a half a dozen of them on the table and there are six very different levels right. of patina on all of them. And it's for those reasons you guys mentioned, right? right. There's so many factors that go into it. Um, I would say to not stress about the patina <laughs> so much, right? It's one of those things that it kind of comes when it comes. It's right. like you can't rush greatness and then, uh, you know, 10, 20, whenever, however many years down the road, uh, you know, it transforms into this beautiful piece and you can just enjoy it. And right. it may already start to patina, just like you don't ever notice your own hair growing. It <laughs> may start to be slowly getting darker, but if it's on your wrist every day, you're not gonna be noticing on the day to day. Right. Yeah. It might already be darker than when it started, but you right. know, you'd have to be taking a picture every day to compare yeah. at that yeah. point. Yeah. All right, well next up, we got an easy one. Uh, this is from YouTube, from T-Bob says, how can I send you a picture of my vintage Daytona? That's a pretty easy one, I guess. Just yeah. email us, Instagram. Instagram. Instagram, so you can no. send it on Instagram, you can DM us directly, you can post it and tag us, you can use the hashtag at Bob's Watches. You can print it out as a poster and send it to us by mail. Yeah, that's a good you, one. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> uh, you can email it to us, ADV at Bob's Watches. Um, any way you want, just yeah. get it to us. I love seeing those pictures. Uh, being the photographer here, I really appreciate them. So yeah, any, uh, any pictures you got of vintage watches, modern watches, whatever, send them to us. We'd love to see them and share them. All right, we got one more question. This is uh, another one from Instagram. This is from John Gertunka. Says, bought a 1987 16014 is my very first Rolex. Any advice on taking it to the beach? I would say don't. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or if you do, make sure not to really get wet. Or if you do want to get it wet, get it pressure tested. But, you know, it's not really a... Datejust is not really like a necessary beach watch, I don't yeah. think. Unless you're just like trying to stay on the boardwalk. 
you know? Or, and beach is a tough environment for a watch. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. any watch. And it's also, you know, you have to kind of look at the cost benefit <laughs> of it. It does have an oyster case, for sure. If you get pressure tested, you really shouldn't have anything to worry about. But that acrylic crystal will scratch it hard, you know, more easily if you come into contact with a rock or something in the right. sand. Right. And on top of that, if anything does go wrong, the cost to repair that day just is going to be exponentially more than, you know, some a cheap digital new, watch yeah. or something like that where it's just kind of, you know, almost disposable. Yeah. I would say if you're going to want to wear it, get it pressure tested. Yeah. At that out. point, yeah, at that point you know at least the seals are good. You still have to worry about having it pulled off your wrist and lost in the surf and all of, of that. Course, sure. yeah. But, you know, I, I think watches are meant to be worn. If someone wants to wear it, do it carefully. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, I kind of agree with Brandon where I'm like, I don't, <laughs> don't really want to yeah. wear it to the beach, but I also think, look, watches are meant to be worn, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to be the last person to talk you out of wearing your watch somewhere you want to wear it. Um, I would just to say if it was me personally, I would probably try not to take it in the water for one fear of losing it. You know, yeah. like you said, it gets ripped off in the surf, or you know, maybe the, the seals aren't that great or whatever. Um, right. And I would try and keep it out of the sand. Um, outside of those two things, um, and then probably if you do take it to the beach, uh, rinse it off with some fresh water yeah. Yeah. to kind of clean off yeah. that salt air, the, any sand, any of that stuff. But yeah, absolutely wear it at the beach. Just be careful and enjoy yeah. it, right? Make sure your crown is closed. That's a yeah. big one. Oh, always have the crown screwed yeah, down. Yeah, that's the big one. So <laughs> yeah. that's step one. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. All right, well, that was great, guys. That was all the questions we had for today. I yeah, appreciate nice. the uh, the info and the answers. Yeah, Yeah, and keep sending us them because we're going to be doing this again. So yeah, if you have anything, we got some good stuff. Yeah, send it via Instagram, drop it in the comments, and we'll answer it at some point. Yeah. Well, that about wraps it up for our vintage GMT Master reference 16750. And that also wraps up for our questions this week. Uh, don't forget to tune in next time for another episode, and we'll see what vintage watch we have for you then.